man, that name of Father, and we share that name with Him. It comes a lot of responsibility, a lot of accountability with that name. And uh, these days and age, it's no, it's so challenging uh, to, to hold up to the standards that God has for that that job. So, and we'll read here in 24. So He sent His brethren away, and they departed, and said unto them, See you that you fall not out by the way. And they went up out of Egypt and came in the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words that Joseph, the jo words of Joseph which he had said unto them, and when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, is it, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. So you may be seated. Thank you. For those of you who are not familiar with the story of Jacob and Joseph, Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brother, and his father had been made to believe that uh, he had been killed by a wild animal. All they had to prove, they had, had no body. All they had to prove was the coat, uh, many colors, and dipped in calf's blood. So you can imagine, and, and Jacob, Joseph, I'm sorry, through a series of uh, too many trials to, relate, to go to into today, he had been promoted to a level of government, whereas he was ruler over all the land, and the Lord had blessed him with knowledge and wisdom, and he had uh, prepared for this famine that had, was, that was striking. Uh, the country at the time, and there was provision there in Egypt, and Joseph was the overseer of all that provision. Uh, so Jacob, famine's in the land of Jacob, uh, famine's in the land of Canaan, and Jacob sends his sons to, to Egypt to, to buy food. And uh, when they get there, Joseph, the brother they sold into slavery, is the governor over all that. He's the overseer of this. And uh, they send Joseph, they send, he sends his brothers back to retrieve Jacob, his father, to bring them to. And so you can imagine the, the emotional roller coaster that Jacob was on here because all these years he'd been led to believe that his son was killed by a wild, beastly animal. And, you know, he, he had buried him in his mind already, you know, even though he never had a body to bury and there was no other proof other than this couple colored many colors uh, to prove to him that he had uh, been killed. But you can imagine, he just did not want to believe that this son was alive because he had already buried that emotion in, in the back of his mind and in his heart and everything. So, But here's what I find interesting. That in verse 27, 27, when he told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them, and when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And I believe he had sinking into such a, a low place of depression for all of these years that he had been made to believe that his son was dead and he would never see him again. So that's the depth that he had for the love that, that he had for that son, that it was revived out of a spirit of depression. Something in that wagon I believe Joseph sent the finest wagon and all of this provision, all these good things that he sent to bring him to the land of Egypt. And I believe Jacob took one look at that and saw a ray of hope and said, you know, only somebody who loves me and only somebody who has my best interests at heart and only somebody who wants to be reunited in relationship with me would do that for me. And his spirit was revived because there was a ray of hope to say, I believe, I believe my, my son is alive. So he says, it's enough. I believe you. Let's load up and go. Let's, let's go. It's enough is what he said. He used the word, it is enough. So, but I want us to notice that this separation between Jacob and Joseph was not brought on by either one of them. They did not want to be. Jacob loved Joseph. God had put a, a, a blessing and anointing on Joseph's life. 
and he loved him. And, and Joseph loved Jacob. And they did not want to be separated, but this was the actions of his brothers that had caused this separation. And, and so many times, let me get a little roar there, so many times the actions of other people might cause us to lose relationship with God. Uh, people can use hurtful words sometimes and plant seeds of discouragement in our life. We spoke about this in Sunday school a little bit this morning. Uh, uh, that, that would cause us to, to lose confidence in our relationship with God, but ultimately it is up to us to stay in relationship with God and to just brush people off. Brush them off. Don't worry about it. But I, Joseph was never upset. He never intended to use this power he had been given. He wasn't upset at his brothers. He, he was not going to use all of this power to make things any harder on his family than, than what they already were. I noticed in verse number 5 of that same chapter, 45, now, now therefore be not grieving nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Sometimes we're put in situations, and, and notice there he said life. Not your life, not my life, but life in general. I believe that this land of Egypt and the, the planning ahead that, that God had gave the, the vision, the dream, and the, and the ability to Joseph to plan ahead for this famine. I believe he was preserving all. I believe they were really financing the whole country at that time as far as provision and food because nobody had foreseen this famine coming. Be, I believe it was more than just their life or his life, but I mean life all together. So... You know, we're put in situations sometimes that we don't understand that, uh, you know, that you know, apparently they're just like Joseph here. Things don't work out like we planned sometimes, but we always got to remember that God is working everything out for our good if we're serving Him. So I recently told someone that I never wanted to be ahead or behind God. You know, in the leadership of this church, I'm just really struggling to always be clear on hearing his voice clearly when he speaks. But I found out that if I will follow his instructions for today, that he'll be preparing my tomorrows for me, and I won't have to worry about it. And I use it sometimes. Robbie jokes at me. I ain't going to stress about it, so I say. So I just, I'm done stressing. So. But I want to talk about another separation in the Bible and it's uh, found in the 15th chapter of Luke. Charles Dickens, many of you know a great American uh, author, uh, wrote such great novels as uh, uh, I guess the most famous one I know him for would be A Christmas Carol. Uh, he said one time that the story of the prodigal son was probably the greatest short story he had ever heard. And, uh, uh, it's so easy to understand. But let's notice in uh, verse uh, 17 of the chapter 15 of uh, Luke. And when he had came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I'll perish with hunger. The provision the son needed, he one time walked away from. He, it was back at the father's house. He had walked away from that at one time. So he remembered there was plenty, that, that the Lord had plenty for him waiting back at him at his house. And uh, you all know the story of Prodigal Son. We spoke a little bit about it in Sunday school this morning. How he, he had taken everything he had and joined himself to a foreign land and how that uh, he, he wasted away, found himself in starvation and, and all alone in a pig pen, nearly dead. So... He's remembering all going back to what all the good blessings that he had when he was living with his father and when he was there with him. And verse number 20, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The father was expecting him. He, this is faith in action. 
I believe he had a point of advantage. I don't know if it was a hill or if it was out away from his, his land where, he, where he's at, but I believe he went there regularly, even every day, to look out across there because he was expecting that son to come home every day. That's faith in that. You, some of you and, and myself, we pray for our lost loved ones, and every week we may be in the altar, we may just attend church, we may call them, witness to them, but that's faith in action. Do not give up on a lost family member. Just as Father, He never gave up on His Son coming home to the point where He had a special place where He could see you far away off and He would go there, sit and wait on that Son to come home. And said He had compassion. And that's just a concern for the sufferings He had been through. There wasn't Facebook, there wasn't texting or phone calls, there wasn't any form of communication at that time. So all this time he'd been gone, he had no idea where he was at or what he was into. And we, we've all said it, when your kids hurt, you hurt. And he knew, he could not imagine what kind of shape he was in or where he was at. So he had compassion and concern about his sufferings. And in verse 21... He doesn't answer his son there. Let's read there. It says, And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And notice, he, he doesn't even answer him in verse number 22. He doesn't even answer that statement, but rather he begins to reinstate him as a son just puts the ring on his finger. Just puts shoes and a robe on him. This thinks he's been put back in saving for him. There's, there's no, uh, you know, there's no point there where he says, "I told you so," or "I, you should have known better." I thought I told you better than that. I thought I told you better than that. And he just gives him the best that he has to offer and to reinstate him into a position of sonship with him. And notice in verse twenty-four. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found and they began to be married. There's a celebration here that he, he has been preparing for for years that had revived within this father's heart the depths of his love for his son. And if you'll notice in both in the case of Jacob and Joseph, the provision the son needed was with the son that the father needed. Jacob needed the provision to keep his family alive, to keep the land of Canaan going. And that provision was back at the son's house, or at the son's place of government in Egypt. And in the story of the lost son, the provision was back at the father's house. So you have something to offer God. He's given you talents, abilities, and gifts that only you can do. And he has everything to offer you. So, in both stories, I want you to, to know that Joseph ran to meet Jacob, and then the father ran to meet the son. God will meet you wherever you're at, and under whatever condition that you are. He, he will. We got a little presentation we're going to do, so I kind of kept it a little bit short. So I'm going to ask the singers and musicians to come.